Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 24 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome, everyone, and uh, Ramadan Mubarak and Ramadan Kareem to everyone. Hope y'all's Ramadan is going well. We're, before you know it, we're in the last 10 days. By the time time they're hearing this, it will be Eid Eid. or the last day of Ramadan. That is very true. That is very true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're here here to celebrate Eid because because uh, you know we're 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 recording we're we're ten days in the future right now imagine that yeah. uh, so to help us celebrate we have a guest who I've been wanting to have on for for a long time and and I reached out to to her uh, many many moons ago and we just had some miscommunication because because she thought she was going to be on the movie film podcast which is going to happen these days but she's here with us uh she is Maysoon Zaid she's an american actress comedian and advocate who's of palestinian descent she's considered one of the usa's first muslim women comedians and the first person ever to perform stand up in palestine and jordan Maysoon, thank you so much for joining us hey nice to me- nice to be here you know technically it could be eid and the last day of ramadan it could oh, be that's- both that's true. Because, you know, we have a problem deciding on what date it actually is. We, we do. And it, it's, a, it's a weird – you'd think we'd – with all the technology and, and the advances we've made, it's weird how this is the one problem that does not go away and just people get so pissed off about it. So angry. And I'm excited because the New York City school system finally added aid to the public school calendar. And yeah. it's in the summer for like the next seven years. <laughs> <laughs> they made a safe bet. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, I mean, there was a lot of uproar over that. There's always oh. uproar. Uproar yeah, is like the thing to do these days. <laughs> hey. There's, there's, you know, there was, I think, Zucky, there was another stat, I, I, I think, that uh, I read somewhere, uh, Mason, and, and you can correct this, but uh, I think your TED Talk was also, like, one of the most viewed TED Talks of the year or it of the, the last... was the number one TED Talk of 2014, and I keep telling people I beat out white privilege. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Big time. Well, congratulations. I beat out all the men, and the men outnumber the women. I beat out, like, Edward Snowden, and it was fun. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I didn't. I didn't actually know what I was doing when I went to do it. They were like, "Come do this TED," and I was like, "Okay." And people are like, "Wow, you're doing a TED," and I'm like, "Yeah, they don't even pay me. I don't know why I'm doing it." <laughs> well, well, let, I mean, let's talk about that now. Now, you you occupy kind of a, a unique niche, occupy, obviously. Because I'm, I'm occupied. Yeah. I am not an occupier. <laughs> okay, let's get those Touché. two things pretty distinctly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Touche. Um, but in, in the realm of, of Muslim comedians, I feel like th- that by itself is a fairly unique, uh, you know, that there, there aren't that many, although certainly the number is growing. And so certainly female Muslim comedians, that there's even fewer still. And so you've staked out a unique space for yourself. Uh, what, what prompted you to get into comedy? What was, what was your beginning uh, in that journey? Well, my dream in life is to be on General Hospital. It was when I was five, and I shouldn't have been watching soap operas because they're super haram, and it's still my dream today. And when I started auditioning after graduating college, I realized that American television does not cast people with disabilities hmm. unless the character is written as disabled. And even when the character is written as disabled, they tend to cast famous actors in those roles instead of people with actual disabilities. So when I looked at the TV, not only did I not see disability, but I certainly didn't see that many brown girls because we're looking at, you know, 15 years ago when I got into comedy. And the people I saw who looked like me were like Whoopi Goldberg, you know, Richard Pryor, and like Carol Burnett, you know, they weren't perfect. They were kind of, some of them were people of color, but they were definitely not Jennifer Aniston and Angelina Jolie. And I was like, this is my way in. My way in is through comedy. 
Hmm. And the disability didn't really register when I got into comedy. When I got into comedy, it was more about being brown and being super tall and not really skinny. Like I didn't even realize what a big factor the disability was until I really got in the game and saw how shocked people were that Hmm. I was a functioning human being with a disability. (laughs) Sure. Well, I mean, in in that sense, I mean, what what are some of the challenges you encountered as you uh, sort of made your way in this field? So I started out before there was YouTube because I'm an old woman. And um, <laughs> in Arab years, I should be dead already. Um, <laughs> I started out when you used to hang out at comedy clubs and wait till 1.30 in the morning to get your turn on a open mic. And we also did these things called bringer shows where if you didn't bring 10 people, you didn't get to go on stage and your friends would like flake at the last minute and you're like, you're not in my will. And then um, I got to do shows with Louis Black and Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock because we would be doing these bringer shows or these open mics and these huge comedians would just walk in to try out their sets. So I've had the privilege of working with all those guys and seeing those guys work and seeing them build their sets and work through their sets. Then when I started touring, I I always joke that I think my parents secretly wanted to kill me because I, when I started touring, I drove across country doing shows with no GPS and no mobile phone by myself. I mean, it's insane. (laughs) I should have been serial killed like seven times, but alhamdulillah, (laughs) Allah protected me. And uh, that's how I got into comedy. And I can't stress enough how little of a factor my disability was. So I always mentioned it right at the top of my comedy set because when I decided to try comedy, I took a class at Caroline's Comedy Club and had a fantastic, fantastic teacher named Michael Irwin. And he made us get up on stage the first night and I had this really, really bad Jesus and Mary joke because I was heavily influenced by like Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor and Andrew Dice Clay and I was really just slurry the comic. And I went up there and I got done and he was like, okay, what's going on with you? Because Hmm. my cerebral palsy is not obvious. So I do jokes on stage that like I look drunk or I look super tired or like people just don't know what the hell is going on with me. And so he said to me, listen, if you don't tell the audience, they're going to sit there the whole time just trying to figure it out and they're not going to listen to you. They're going to think that you're drunk and that you don't care about your audience because you're walking on stage drunk and that's not funny either. And so I did, I had to put cerebral palsy in my set. And it was like a real moment in time where like it became part of my identity in that moment. Mm-hmm. And up until that time, it was something that really annoyed me, but it didn't define me. And it sure. became part of who I am the second that I made the choice to include it in my comedy. And so I was still a little nervous. And so I buried it between everything else that was wrong with me. And that was when I came up in that class on that night. I came up with my opening, which I used until the day I got married, which was, I'm a Palestinian Muslim virgin with cerebral palsy from New Jersey. And if you don't feel better about yourself, maybe you should. So so in other words... (laughs) the notion of of incorporating your cerebral palsy into your routine was not something like you you didn't want to necessarily deal with it head on initially it wasn't no i was i was so not even thinking about it yeah but palestine israel was right there the entire time from like day one joke one it was there and people okay. were like don't do it you'll never have a career and i was like i'm doing it <laughs> <laughs> And that's well, why well, I live on the Z list with Zeki. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's a good place to be. So, <laughs> but 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 I mean, let me ask you about that now. Now, your your activism uh, goes hand I'm in hand. I'm not an activist. I'm an advocate. Yeah, sure. Fair, fair enough. Smart, and they smell like trees. <laughs> well, you're okay. So your advocacy. Uh, certainly goes hand in hand with your comedy. Uh, right. At at what point did you 
Now you said it was it was it was there from the beginning. It was I there mean, from the beginning. I started doing stand up comedy in January of 1999, okay. and in September of 2000, the second Intifada broke out, and that's when it started. That moment. Okay. So, in other words, you you made a calculation where you're you're feeling frustration over things that are happening, and you and you have a forum through your comedy to be able to address it. My comedy was always really personal, like mm-hmm. talking about my family or something that happened with my friends, and uh, the second end of all was personal, so it had to be part of my comedy. It wasn't as conscious as it should have been. It was just like, of course I'm going to talk about this, because I had always talked about politics. Like in 2008, I was a delegate at the Democratic National Convention, so I talked sure. about politics a lot. My entire run on Countdown with Keith Oberman was all about politics, not about being Muslim or disabled or Palestinian. It was just about right. politics. So I it was always a big part of my comedy. And when the Intifada started, that Palestinian aspect came in. But the Palestinian part, the being Palestinian, was there from day one because I was doing jokes about my mom and dad and going, you know, back home you know, to the Dead Sea every summer. And it was, again, not... At the time, I'm 21 years old. Second Intifada hasn't started. We don't have Twitter. We don't have Facebook. And I'm not conscious of the fact that being Palestinian is the kiss of death. Hmm. Well, well, can you expand on that? Why, Why is there that perception that being Palestinian is the kiss of death? I don't know. We live in bizarre world. I always say this on, on, you know, I'm obsessed with Twitter. I'm I'm on it all the time because I'm a comedian and it's like having an open mic 24-7. Like whenever you want to try jokes, you're like, hey, captive audience. But um, I was, you know, I was on there and I said to them, it is mind boggling to me that I'm considered controversial because I believe that Palestinians deserve equality and that there is never a valid excuse to massacre children. And that is considered controversial. I had to write an article in the Daily Beast about how I'm not anti-Semitic because the assumption in my like circles in Hollywood and in the New York City acting scene or that being Palestinian is the equivalent of being anti-Semitic. And people don't want to put me on shows to talk about Madonna because they think that I'm this horrible anti-Semitic person because I don't think you should carpet bomb children in a shelter in, you know, an imprisoned 1.8 miles like Gaza when they can't flee. And when I talk about that, they're like, all you ever do is vilify Israel. And I'm like, This is like slut shaming. It's not me that's slut shaming them. It's them who are behaving like sluts. So, you know, I, I think it's a really bizarre thing. And I, you know, we live in America and it's like the United States was just the only person, the only person to vote against condemning Israel's action in Gaza a year ago. And so we live in a society where we're told the Palestinians deserve to die. They need to die. They're asking to die. They are requesting that they die. And when I break it down and I say, the only reason Palestinians are being killed is because they're the wrong faith. It's as basic as that. This is about supremacy. This is about people who are not given equal rights simply because they are the wrong faith. And people don't want to hear that. Well, to that point, what... What kind of reactions did you get initially when you, I mean, you know, this has always been kind of a tabloid. I've had topic. tables of people get up and walk out of a club when wow. I started talking about Palestine, Israel, especially when I was young and I wasn't politically correct. Like, I mean, I, was, I would just go for it and say crazy, inappropriate stuff um, and also politically relevant stuff. But um, I've had full tables of people walk out and the TED Talk. This is such an amazing moment. So I do the TED Talk, and as I stepped on stage, I was like, whoa. It was one of those moments. Sometimes I run through my life, and I don't realize that I'm in the middle of something, like, really epic. 
And that happened when I, w- I was at the DNC when uh, Barack Obama got his nomination. And I had a moment. I was like, oh, my God, like I'm part of this. And I walked out on the TED stage and I was like, whoa, this is way bigger than I thought it was. Like I didn't realize what was going to happen. And I got off stage and everyone like was like huddled around me and they were like, this was amazing. We've never seen anything like it. And one woman came up to me and she goes, why did you say Palestine? What does that mean? Palestine doesn't exist. In the middle of the TED forum, this really hard forum to get into where you have to like, you know, apply and register. And it's like this elite group of women. And she had to be there and descend upon me. And I looked at her and I said, because it's not part of my story. It didn't have a part in my story. And I find it really frustrating that people demand balance from me because I don't understand how I'm supposed to balance something so simplistic. I do not think that side has the right to oppress people. There's no other side to this. Right. One-sided. You don't have the right to oppress me. We're done. Yeah, do good. I sound angry? I'm not No, angry. no. I'm a really not- happy, funny Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, not, not, not at all. Yeah, not, not at all. No, absolutely. So, so like you, you kind of allude to your background, um, being Palestinian, growing up in uh, in, in Jersey. Um, so, were you were you kind of born on the East Coast? You're born in Jersey. I'm you born, grew up there. I'm born in Anglewood, New Jersey, and I grew up in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, where I will live probably until I know I'm about to die, and then I'll race back to Palestine so I can die there. <laughs> 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 well, that, that, Zeki said nice like that because he knows I mean it because that's how Palestinians are. <laughs> well, well, I, I mean, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about like sort of your background, like like growing up in, in Jersey, and what was it? A, was there a big Palestinian community? Where uh, was it? A kind of a like a uh, like the neighborhood was pretty diverse. Uh, how, how did that inform you? you know, Born and raised in Jersey. I'm the youngest of four girls, no brothers. So that's big, right? That that informs like just everything. My mom was um, taught by nuns in Ramallah. So she spoke English and she spoke Spanish and she spoke French and she was extremely educated. And my mother looks like a China doll. She has like white skin and red hair. She's left over from the Crusaders, I guess. And my dad looked like Saddam Hussein. So he's like cartoonishly, <laughs> cartoonishly Arab related Hama. And uh, he and my mom came here really chasing the American dream. So my dad came here in 1959 with like $40 and a dream. And he built his own business. He used to sell Stereos and bedspreads to migrant workers from Haiti who didn't have credit. So he created his own credit system and would sell these things from the back of a van. And he did it from the age of 29 until the age of 75 and, you know, had a a wonderful life doing so. My mom had four children and then began college because she got married like probably three weeks after she graduated high school. And so she had all four of us and then went to college and became a medical technologist and then got a master's. And now she's the chief of lab at Jersey City Medical Center. So I grew up in a Muslim household that was also a Palestinian household where Mm -hmm. my mom looked and dressed like a Barbie doll. So I was raised with like my mom wore sleeveless and like cute little mini dresses and we still fasted Ramadan. We spoke Arabic. We learned Quran. Like so many other American Muslims, I had a horrible, awful Saturday Quran school teacher who was like <laughs> the man who makes you never want to learn anything again. <laughs> Were you like, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that transcends culture. So it's not a cultural thing. It's it's, it's a total who, Muslim thing. Who are these people? And I know. Mine, right. mine smelled like like bananas that had been left out in the sun. That's what you smell <laughs> like. And I used to take a deep breath before I would go in because I knew that I would have to smell it. Like you cannot learn Dean under those circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> the shaitan is real. 
That's a good one. Yeah, I assume that was just an Indo-Pak thing. I know. I I, that's what I'm saying. It sort of transcends yeah. across cultures. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And, and I mean, <laughs> in, in general, Palestinians smell like jasmine. So I have no idea where they found this guy, but he was Arab and he was stank. Stank. <laughs> So, so that was so. So you're you're you have sort of the quintessential. Nothing. Uh, sorry. I'm just laughing wildly at remembering and and hearing this story from so many other Muslim oh, yeah. kids that it was just either super boring or just torture. You know, it's that's so interesting because I feel like that's that's something that the American Muslim community really has to figure out is how to. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, in terms of of creating a love of the Quran and whatnot, like this is not the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, well, because see, now they have the internet, and there's all these amazing videos where you can like sing along and see interpretations, and it's fun now. Yeah. It's on the iPad now, Zaki. It's on the iPad. There you go. <laughs> well, we're, we're making progress. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're. we're we're getting there, hopefully. I'm trying to figure out a candy crush could on joke that's not offensive, but I'm gonna leave that for later. <laughs> like, you, can, you can tweet like, that. Later. You know, like with Teruiha, you could crush soda by soda. Like each time you finish a soda, you get points. Now, that that's all haram. It's all haram. Move on. <laughs> I, I don't know, Pervez. What do you think? Halloween is, that... is not haram. Can we talk about this? Please. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't think that Halloween is haram, and every single year at Halloween, like, this heated debate breaks out on Facebook yeah. about Halloween being haram. Now, I get the Christmas thing, but I don't get the Christmas thing, especially as a Palestinian. Like, for me, I'm like a Christmas-loving Muslim because Jesus was born in Palestine, and he's a prophet, and why not? Like, decorate a tree, it's fun. But um, Halloween is not really a religious holiday, and Muslims are constantly trying to convince me that it is because it has some sort of origins and ghosts and All Saints Day. And I'm like, but nobody in America knows that. So, like, just because you looked it up on Wikipedia doesn't mean it's haram. So I did a comedy festival. Dean and I do this thing called the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. And we had it on Halloween uh, last year. So I dressed up as a Palestinian flapper. I was wearing a flapper costume, but it was the colors of the Palestinian flag. And I had on the turtleneck and leggings because that's how Muslim kids have to do Halloween. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> the costumes are all way too open. So your parents make you wear a turtleneck and leggings so that you don't look, you know. Islamicize it, right. Yeah, halal, halalify it. Yeah. It's, a halalify, it's a halalifying Halloween, right? And so I said, Halloween's not haram unless your costume is haram. So I'm like... And so I walked out into the lobby, and this woman came up to me, and she was really angry. And she was like, Maysoon, Halloween is haram. Yani, this is not the joke. And I was like, okay, okay. Like, I totally hear you. So how are you doing? How's your husband's <laughs> I go, how's your husband's liquor store? She goes, alhamdulillah, wallah, my husband made great money. <laughs> See, in, in my house, Halloween is haram, uh, not for religious reasons, but because I have four boys, and I made the mistake a few years ago of uh, of taking them uh, trick-or-treating, and uh, they ate all their candy at once. Oh, my gosh. And so the, that night involved uh, a lot of vomit. Ugh, it's and, like it's like people fasting in the Gulf at the beginning of Ramadan. <laughs> Just, they just overdid it. They're, you've heard these stories, the famous stories of the people in the Gulf who eat so much they get hospitalized. Yeah. It makes me so proud. These are the stories <laughs> that I want in American media. These are the stories that need to be told that humanize us. There's well, a bunch of people true. in America who, if you force them to fast all day, would get super sick when they gluttonize that night. Trust me. It's not just that. <laughs> no, I, it's true. I used to have a system, and I don't know how I never got sick, but I used to have a system. And anything that I craved throughout the day, I would collect, and I would put it next to my seat. So obviously not anything that needed to be heated. But, like, there would be, like, a coffee cake junior, like, cheese doodles, and, like, a Twizzler next to my 
like plate before we would break fast. And sure. if we would break fast, I would eat all the junk first and then my food. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents let me because I was fasting and they were like, just let her, she's fasting. Hold on, Miss Gina. <laughs> yeah, it's fine, you know. It's debatable whether or not I get a pass, right? Because I have cerebral palsy and we expend three times the energy of our non-cerebral palsy counterparts because, like, I'm oh, shaking wow. all the time, right? Sure. So you expend both sugar and water, and we have to drink a lot of water, and if we don't, our muscles get all dry and, like, stiff and brittle. So my, oh my parents were like, whoa, she's fasting. Let, let her eat the coffee cakes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. See, you know, I, I did that didn't even occur to me that that there's a unique set of challenges for you uh, when you do fast. Well, I had to. I actually had to. I stopped fasting two years ago. Oh, okay. Because uh, I I fast. I, I know this is not a film show, but I filmed a documentary called "The Muslims Are Coming." Sure, sure, and yeah. We went to the deep south, and I was fasting in the deep south in August on a tour where the shows were all during a thought. Oh and my I gosh. did it like a champ, like a champ, right? The next year I fasted the first day and I got so sick that I was bedridden for like three days. No, oh, no. The doctor told me I just can't fast anymore. So yeah. now I'm the person who like goes out the first day of Ramadan and writes all the posts on Facebook and Twitter reminding people that if you cannot fast, if it harms your health in any way, you are not required to. And that there's no shame in not being able to fast if you can't because it's heartbreaking and like people don't want to admit that they're not fasting. And Muslims have this horrible habit of walking up to you and going, are you fasting? Are you fasting? Are you fasting? And it's like, you either have to be like, no, and explain why. And it's, you know, it's awkward. So I try to tell them that like, it's okay to be like, no, because health reasons I can't. And then if you can't fast, you just donate. Right. And that's why I hate these stupid rules about like not selling food during Ramadan. Because number one, if there's people who are not Muslim, you shouldn't be depriving them of eating. Number two, women take off a week every Ramadan and they should have access to food. And number three, some of us are sick and can't fast. So at least give us the option. Like it, it's not forced and, and doing stuff like that is so backwards and is why we look silly to the world. Well, right. And I mean, in, in, in Pakistan right now, there's, you know, yeah. the people dying from the heat waves and, and, you know, that seems like one of the situations where it's like, this is a clear hardship. Right. Um, I mean, I don't know, Pervis, I mean, you, you, you've you been following that story, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And there and there's this kind of, uh, I guess, the, like, the, the equivalent of, like, slut shaming or whatever for people who don't, who don't fast. And, yes. and it was definitely the, yeah. There's totally fasting shaming. Fasting shaming, right? Exactly, and 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 I think you bring up a good point about you know certain parts of the world where yeah you can't sell food, you can't you know, um, you know yeah I, I, I eat in public. You know that is you know they have these specified rules. Um, I guess on the flip side or, or the, the positive out of that is in those same cultures, you know everyone whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim sort of gets all of Ramadan off, right? So I mean they basically don't go to work that. Yeah, long, I hate so. that. <laughs> I know, I know, I agree, I agree. It makes I, I just, me right. so angry. Again, not yeah. to be like, you know, the suffering Muslim, but I went to college at Arizona State University. I was a wow. girl. Yeah, and I fasted in Arizona while going to class, while having to limp to class, like I didn't even have a car. And I thought it was at like 9.30 at night, and I was eating like, Gumby's pizza because the cafeteria only served food until nine. Right. So like, I don't get this thing. It really annoys me because, you know, I work in Palestine a lot. I do comedy there and I work with mainstreaming kids with physical disabilities into the school system. And the fact that I can't work at all for the entire month of Ramadan and now suddenly eight is a week instead of three days. Come on. Like, <laughs> this right. is why. We are a mess. Again. Yeah, right, right. I mean, it's ridiculous. I called, I wanted to get a Braille printer, and they were like, well, it's Ramadan. I'm like, you can't go to the store and carry a Braille pl printer to a school because it's Ramadan? Like, where does it say that you're supposed to sleep on your face the entire sunlight hours and then 
eat everything until you barf at night and then watch <laughs> and then watch like super haram skanky Turkish soap operas. Like how did that become a Ramadan tradition? Wow. That's so you funny. Yeah, yeah. The, do you guys know about the Turkish soaps that everyone's obsessed with? I'm, I'm, I'm aware of their existence, yeah. So in the Arab world, it's like the thing to do is watch these Turkish soap operas after you break fast and like nobody talks to anybody and husbands and wives get in a fight because the husband wants like some, you know, some dessert. And she's like, I'm watching the Turkish soap opera. And they write about it on the news. It's, it's the 1950s. It's insane. That's so odd. <laughs> <laughs> that is very odd. I'm going to tweet you, I'm going to tweet you an entire story about a Turkish soap opera named Noor that will make your head spin, which again, if people around the world realize that most people fight more about whether Noor should be with this guy or her husband than they do about religion, we'd be in a better spot. <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> Well, so so talking about your your own journey now, now yeah. you mentioned uh, performing comedy in in Palestine. Uh, what what led up to that? What uh, you know, according to your bio, you're, you're the first person to do that. See, uh, I don't know what bio it is that you have because I always tell people, don't ever say I'm the first because I don't know if there was someone before me that just never like had any notoriety and like died before videotaping. As sure, sure. far as I know, as far as I know I am, but I, I don't like claiming it. So here's what happens. Second Intifada starts. I'm watching the TV and they kept repeating, you know, the news like to glom on to these images. And they kept repeating this image of a crushed wheelchair in Janine. And it was a really interesting time where, again, you didn't have the technology that we have now. And they weren't letting journalists and cameras into Janine. So nobody knew what happened during the invasion. And these were all images of the aftermath. And I see this crushed wheelchair and I'm like, oh my God, they're creating a whole new generation of people with disabilities in a place where they don't know how to deal with the ones who are born this way. I want to go over there and teach them theater like Michelle Pfeiffer from Dangerous Minds so they stop throwing rocks. <laughs> <laughs> So I totally didn't get it, like, at all. Like, I thought I would go, I would teach them theater, they would stop throwing rocks, the Israelis would stop shooting them, and it would be fantastic, right? You'd solve, you'd solve the problem single-handedly. Like Michelle Pfeiffer. I mean, one might get killed, like, in her movie, but that just, you know, makes the ending all that much sweeter. So, <laughs> <laughs> this this story was obviously prepared for the other podcast, but I'm running with it because it leads directly into what you asked. So <laughs> I go to Palestine to start this program, and I get there, and I'm like, oh, my God, they need shoes, and they are not even allowed in school. Where do I start? So I abandon the theater idea, and I start working with Maysoon's kids. And what Maysoon's kids' goal was is to... Currently, because of the situation in Palestine, not because of lack of effort, alive kids with physical disabilities aren't allowed to go into the public school system. The parents don't have any services to deal with things like speech therapy or learning sign language, or if you don't have arms, how do you write? If you can't speak, how do you test? They just don't have the services. So what we wanted to do was take these kids and teach them, and then in the third grade, mainstream them into the public school system. Because by mirroring the Palestinian school system curriculum, we're able to get them to test on the same or higher level. So I go there to do that, and everyone's like, so you're a teacher? And I'm like, no. And they're like, what do you do? I'm like, I tell jokes. And they're like, it's my <laughs> job. I'm like, it's totes a job, right? And again, you don't have YouTube. So I can't be like, googlemaystoon.com, you know. Uh, so I said, well, let's do a show. And we did a show at a theater in Bethlehem called Dar en Nedwa. And it was my first show. And it was in 2002. Cross over to Jordan because my uncle and my cousins live there and I just wanted to go to this place called Maine that has like hot waterfalls that kind of heals my CP for like six hours. So I go there and they're like, how's Palestine? I was like, oh, I did a comedy show. And they're like, do a comedy show in Jordan. 
I do the comedy show in Jordan and somewhere somebody famous saw me because by the next time a radio station brought me out to do comedy shows in Jordan and it was me, Aaron and Dean and the King of Jordan came and all the princes came and whatnot. And that turned into us going to Egypt and Beirut and Dubai and Qatar. And the only place I ever turned down the show was Saudi. Oh, interesting. And, and why was that? Uh, I'm only going to Saudi for Hajj or when they stop forcing women to wear abaya. I'll never mm. be forced to wear abaya in the street. I wear, um, you know, I cover myself when I go to the mesh shed. I have no problem with that. That's totally fine. And it's totally different than being in the street. But the idea of like walking around being forced to be covered by a patriarchal sinister monarchy is just not something I'm willing to bow down to. Mm. Sure. <laughs> well, and yeah, they, they have you know they have the the decency police over there with the right. with the sticks. I mean, I I, yes, I lived in. Yes. This I, is I, something I said. I I really don't want to die. I want to be like super old and stuff. But if I were to you know get killed in Palestine, I could understand that. But what I don't want to have happen is like flogging. Like I can't handle being tortured. I'm not cut out for that. I need like quick death, bullet to the back of the head, just be done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. This is you should probably say something Muslim that says God forbid. In yeah, well, Arabic, we say La Allah. Yeah, that might right, right. Yeah, we have our equivalents too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, I mean, I, I, I when I lived in Saudi Arabia, I, I saw yeah. that I saw that firsthand. The the mutawas. Yeah. The mutawas, the morality police. Yeah. Why were you living in Saudi Arabia? I, I lived there um, from the age of three to uh, just before I turned 13 because my, my dad had a job there. Nice. So, so you lived I, on one of those crazy compounds? Uh, we, we did live in a compound briefly, yeah. Why don't you make a movie about the Saudi compound life? Nobody knows what happens in there. Oh, you know, it's, it's, that's it's, a great it, idea because it is. It, it's, it's, it's so Can weird. I be because, a bit? Well, it's of course. It, yeah, it, it, and having you know, like so, I, I I didn't I didn't spend any time there, but my but my family also spent about fifteen years uh, working in Saudi Arabia. My uh -huh. father uh, and it's, it was yeah, it was an Aramco compound uh, near the Haran, and so yeah, you're very. That's it, it, a that's a really good point in terms of this like really weird, unique subculture I that just, an, an oasis, uh, if you will, an oasis. <laughs> Okay. It's such a subculture, though, because, again, like I was talking about the the Saturday school teachers, the people that randomly lived on a compound at some portion of their childhood. There's a lot of you guys, like a lot. Yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they're a different breed. Their Arabic is slightly wrong. It's weird. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, you you live it's sort of inoculated. It's it's, you it's like you're you're in this bubble. And you only really, and and it was different. I mean, because Aramco, you know, they had their own TV and whatnot. Yeah. Like I lived, I lived in Riyadh, and so it wasn't, you know, we 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 were a little bit more, uh, I don't know what's the word, assimilated, if you Assimil will. Yeah. Um, so was, but go ahead. When I was going, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But when I was, oh. I got all excited about the TV. When I was going, to, <laughs> when I used to go to Palestine as a kid to to Palestine as a kid. They had like almost all American TV. So there was this one station that would turn off with a really loud beeping noise at 11 p.m. Like 11 p.m. There was just no more TV. But when it was on, it was like Dallas, the TV show Dallas and like Battle of the Network Stars. And like I have no idea what this channel was or where it came from. That's so funny. Yeah. Well, can't, can't go wrong with Dallas. That's that's one of my favorite. But TV again, shows. like a bunch of people in Palestine watching Who Shot Jr. like seven years later, <laughs> because there was like a delay. You know, they yeah. don't do it the same time that. So I'm like, I know, and they're like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I was the original spoiler. <laughs> that's so, you know, in in Saudi Arabia, they would do the same thing where where shows like popular shows here in the states would end up there maybe like two or three years later. Or shows that totally didn't survive and were exactly. on TV for like 
six weeks there exactly I'm like oh wow okay my that's, see, I, I, I do a feature on my blog called nostalgia theater where i dig up old shows and things that people have, have no idea of and people are always like how do you know about this and i'm like i lived in saudi arabia for 10 years <laughs> This is all they showed was these people, canceled shows. And people think we're older than we are because they're like, you shouldn't know about that. I'm like, well, you have to understand it came to Palestine 20 years later. So, <laughs> That's exactly- so basically what you're saying is you want me to write a guest blog about Islam for that blog? I, I think you may need to. <laughs> I think you may need to. <laughs> So, um, so, so circling back around, now, now you mentioned... Circling back where? I lost you so long ago. <laughs> that's true. We've kind of, we, we've taken a very circuitous, <laughs> we've taken the scenic route, but I think, I think it's been a, a fun journey here. Yeah. Um, we, we had Dean on, on the show a, a few months ago. I don't remember. Pervez, when was that? I, yeah. No. Was it, uh, was it, it was last fall, I think, right? Yeah, I think it was in the fall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Yeah. so um, yeah, he, he, he talked about uh, the Muslims are coming uh, uh, quite a bit, but I'd, I'd love to hear your uh, your perspective on how that documentary came together. <laughs> we should do this when it's not Ramadan. Um, so the Muslims are coming. All right, the Muslims are coming was hands down the most difficult time in my entire comedy career. And like I said, like. I've done shows all over the world. I've done shows in Dubai, which is like the worst place I've ever been in my life. I call it the Las Vegas of the Middle East. And why would you want to go to Las Vegas with a bunch of Arabs? So um, I, Dean calls me up and says, we're going to do this documentary. We're going to go to the Deep South and we're going to do comedy shows in places where Muslims face a lot of hate. And I'm like, this is the greatest concept ever. And I'm super excited because the heat doesn't bother me. I was an Arizona kid. I love Georgia and Nashville and the places that we're going, even though we're going to places that people hate us. They're places that I like road trips with my family as a kid. And I was like really excited to go back. And it was four comics, me, Nagin Farsad, Omar Alba from Egypt and Dino Badala. And sure. we did this tour. We flew into Florida and then we road tripped the rest of the tour. And as I said, the entire time I'm fasting, all of our shows are doing the time that we break fast, but the crowds are spectacular. And we were so shocked. Now we did these shows for free. So keep that in mind that free just draws people in certain towns because there's nothing else to do, but they sure. were so receptive and they were so like not, it wasn't Arabs and Muslims that were coming. Sure, there were those who knew us and came just to see us, but most of the room didn't actually know who we were. And they were just coming to see these Muslims. And some of them were coming to hate these Muslims. And they would walk away just being like, oh my God, you're so funny. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you, you know. And (laughs) it was, that aspect of it is stunning. It's amazing. But I had a really hard time during the Muslims are coming because Nagin Farsid, who is a fellow female stand-up comedian, she and I approach Islam in a very, very, very different way. And huh. it's funny because I've been on tours with Christians and I've been on tours with, you know, godless people, and I've never had an issue with anyone, but it was extremely hard touring with her while fasting during Ramadan because she couldn't understand why I was doing it. Hmm. And so when I would ask at night to break my fast, she, you know, and I would be like, listen, this is a town where if I don't eat by 10 o'clock, there's no restaurants, right? Because we're in like Columbus, Georgia or something like that. And she was like, just get a bagel from 7-Eleven. I'm like, I'll die the next day. And she said, you know, I never forgot this moment. She said to me, nobody told you to fast. And I was Hmm. like, nobody told you to make a movie about Muslims in the middle of Ramadan in the deep south. The next day, I went to Elvis's house, and we were in Tupelo, Mississippi, and Elvis talked to me, so I had to drink water because I was about to pass out. And I felt felt like so defeated because I, 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 um, I broke my fast that day. But I was like, it's okay, I'll, I'll make it up later. Now, to circle back to the Nagin thing, she is a wonderful woman and a brilliant artist. But again, sure. it was very hard for me because her comedy 
was somewhat offensive to me as a Muslim. Hmm. And as a comedian, I always say, we have the right to talk about everything. And we have the right to offend whoever we please. Like all is fair in comedy. As long as you're funny, you mm -hmm. can say whatever you want. And then we can be offended by what you say. So for some reason, I had a really hard time with the representation of Muslim women in the movie because I was just a featured tiny background supporting character who didn't really have a voice in the movie. And I felt like I didn't want the world to think you could only be a comedian if you totally rejected the faith. So it was the okay. most challenging time in my entire career because I am a woman's woman and I want to support my fellow female comics, especially because there's so few of us, which is why I keep saying like, I love Nagin. I really, really respect her, but it was just so hard for me because I was like, I don't want people to think that you can't be devout and still be a comedian. Right. right. That's a, that's a great point. Cause I remember kind of feeling that at just watching the movie. Yeah. Um, that, that, that because was I'm background narrative. and yeah. I'm wearing a tank top, you don't understand that I have a completely different connection and personality and reason for being there. Right, know? which I felt should have been, yeah, and, and like but, sort of equally represented. But but you know what? I mean, that that does highlight the the point you just made. It does highlight the fact that there is so much multiplicity in in this faith. It's not monolithic, and you know, kind of the uh, people on the outside looking in are kind of like they hear the word Muslim and they kind of have this very specific uh, perspective. And you know, this just highlights the fact that you know what? There are differences of opinion. There are people who right. are more serious or less. Serious. You know, I mean, and and I mean that's. That's just a fact of being Muslim. And when you're stuck in a car for 10 days while fasting in the heat with someone who's on a completely different end of the spectrum, sure. you might start screaming and crying at each other. <laughs> right, right, right. Turn into the real housewives of Islam. Um, I, I think, but I think, Rezi, I mean, like, Zaki, I, I think, you, you know, you, you raise a good point and certainly one we've made on this show in the past, but I think... There, there's a little bit more of a nuanced conversation to be had, which I think is what Maysoon kind of, you know, has at least alluded to or really specifically talked about, which is this idea of, of there almost being a sort of a narrative that is safe or that is that is politically correct when it comes to that diverse voice of Muslims, right? Sure. So, so there, thereby you have the sort of Muslim comedian who has rejected the faith and, you know, that's well, okay. not necessarily rejecting it. She's culturally Muslim. She's culturally that's Muslim true. only. But like you said, Maysoon, like to be a devout Muslim and still be, you know, a comedian, um, you know, that's the story it's that... Not, it's not mutually exclusive. It, it's not mutually exclusive, but I'm saying that story is not, quote-unquote, sexy, right? right? And you know this what I mean? is... This is something that I've experienced a lot, right? So one of the yeah. things that one of the things that I do extensively is I go on TV and I'm a contributor. So I'll talk about politics or pop culture or whatever. And I'm always amazed by the fact that they will not bring me in to talk about Islam. And the hmm. reason they don't bring me in to talk about Islam is because I don't fit the two mm -hmm. stereotypes, yeah. burqa or belly dancer. You right. either have to be wearing hijab or you have to be a rejectionist, a real right. rejectionist, someone who, you know, doesn't just despise the faith, but wants it actually destroyed. So the people who are moderate, who approach it in an intellectual way, who grew up in a household where they weren't abused and weren't taught to feel like they were less than their male counterparts. I learned the opposite. And I oh. often tell people, I say, do you think someone with my personality would choose a religion where I didn't feel equal or where I felt, you know, oppressed? And my voice is not amplified in that way. And oh. it's been mirrored by the big Muslim groups in America. So while every single one of my male counterparts get invited to do these banquets for these big Muslim groups, I'm not invited to do them, wow. um, which I think is really amazing because in New Jersey and Long Island and New York, I am because they know me personally, right? So wow. they know who I am and they, they invite me. And I think that it's, 
That's a great we, point. I never even thought of that. We help yeah. reinforce this narrative by constantly challenging who is Muslim and who's not. And I don't mean that in the realm of like ISIS, right? Because we're like, ISIS is not Muslim. You can't call yourself Muslim and then defy like every single thing ever written in the Quran. Right, but, you're, you're not making a theological position as, to, as far as who is Muslim, who is not. You're just talking about the sort of what, we, uh, what exists in, in, in the sort of- But what yeah. American media- Yeah, what? right. Muslims to look like is right. not me. So mm. Dean and I did a film post 9-11 called um, Muslim American Comedians Stand Up. It was America at a crossroads on PBS. And The View put on two comedians from the film and they wanted a guy and a girl. And everyone was like Dean and Maysoon, right? Because we're like Lucy and Ricky without but brother and sister, right? And so <laughs> they didn't pick me. And instead they put on a comedian that had only been on stage about three times whose routine was stripping off the hijab and throwing it behind the couch. Mm. Wow. Well, and I was a girl who dreamt of being on The View, who had written The View, who is like Little Miss High Heels and like perfect hair and makeup and like dying to go on ABC television. And I wasn't picked because they thought it was much more interesting to have a girl strip off the hijab and throw it behind the couch. And you see like what I'm, what I'm up against. So I, I do a joke on stage about it because as someone with a disability, trying to get on television is almost impossible because we're the largest minority and most underrepresented on television. As a Palestinian, Mm. my politics are too controversial. But as a Muslim, I'm apparently not Muslim enough. So, (laughs) like, you know. Or or the right Muslim, right? It's not about even being Muslim enough. It's like the right Muslim. it's very good to be an angry Muslim. Right, right. angry Muslim with a very heavy accent. So we were talking about this um, earlier before we got uh, on the air. I was saying I'm thinking of having like a career makeover where I start behaving like Ayan Hirsi Ali and just being like <laughs> an angry rejectionist so that I can get on Bill Maher and like MSNBC. But oh, yeah. now you made me rethink that. What if I chose angry Arab with heavy accent who you can't actually understand, who screams and waves their hands a lot? <laughs> those guys get booked all the time. That's and right. It's like the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. My hands <laughs> flop involuntarily so I can look angry. <laughs> right. No, no, it's a, it's a great point. Uh, and then, no, but I think something you mentioned while you were talking about, like, be, you know, the invitations that come in, not only for like, the, like, say the show, like the view or something, but also from within the Muslim community. So yeah. you've got a lot of that sort of what like, Du Bois talks about like double consciousness, right? Which is this idea of, of, of like, okay, you know, you have to struggle against being black, but at the same time, you have to be, you have to struggle to be black enough within yeah. your own community. So that's very much kind of what you're talking about with regards. But regard that's to- only with these Muslim groups. Right. That's right. not with actual Muslims. I want to talk about actual Muslims. Yeah, yeah, no. For the you're- entire world uncovered and uncensored, saying the most outlandish things in places where nobody has ever, not man or woman has dared to say the things that I go on stage and say in public. And I do it, right? In my 15 year career, I have never in my life been threatened by a fellow Muslim, not by a troll pretending to be a Muslim, not by a real life Muslim, not by somebody protesting me. It's never happened. The only time I get threatened, it's by these right wing, scary people who are my fellow Americans. Hmm. And they don't identify as Muslim. They, you know, usually identify as Christian or don't identify as any faith. So that's where I've gotten the hate from. So that's what I'm saying about defying the stereotype and being real is like, you know, I've gone to places where they shouldn't have accepted me. I've gone to places where families still hide the fact that they have a child with a disability and I'm on stage. Mm. You know what I mean? And in America, it's where I fear the most. 
Well, let's. Um, I mean, I, I think that's actually a good way to segue into uh, Muslim Funny Fest, which is coming up soon, uh, because that's meant to to address some of this stuff. Well, there's a couple of links there. One is it really addresses the diversity in the community. The fact that being Muslim is not a monolith. And I don't mean it in some weird secretarian way. I mean that, like, we are not a monolith. So people interviewing me for Muslim Funny Fest, which I'm going to tell you all about, one of the questions they ask me is, are Muslims funny? And I'm like, some are and some aren't. Like, it's just like any other faith. Some people know how to tell a knock-knock joke. Other guys can't tell a joke to save their lives, you know? (laughs) But the idea that this is a question is fascinating to me. That is so true. Like, you're calling me from a major publication and asking me something so silly and slightly dehumanizing. Like, no, we're not funny. We, We are a sect of people who never have smiled or laughed or even yuckled. But it's like, it's like an alien species. It's yeah. not even about, you know what I mean? It, it, because imagine substituting Muslim for like black or Jewish or any other, you know, uh, description there. You, th- that person would feel silly asking that question. It's such a silly question. And then the right. next one's even, the next one angers me. The next one angers me. For all you like aspiring journalist bloggies out there, Google the person that you're going to interview before you call them, please. The next question <laughs> that drives me crazy, do non-Muslims find you funny? No. Ha. Ah, I made an entire career and toured with Live Nation and performed on Broadway only selling tickets to Muslims. I've never had a Christian <laughs> laugh at me in their lives. And when people in the audience don't laugh, I walk up to them and I'm like, who's your God? Who's your God? <laughs> I mean, what kind of question is that? What do you mean do non-Muslims laugh at me? Like, <laughs> I'm a professional comedian. Well, that's, I mean, it, it, it tells you something about how, how you know, to, to use Pervez's phrase, how, how alien uh, people perceive Muslims as, as if, you know, there's, there's just a, a, a behavior pattern that is completely antithetical to what's considered, quote-unquote, mainstream. Yeah. And it's really hard to tell those stories, to like write those stories, to get those stories told. And that's why I love being a stand up comedian, because like I love the fact that I get to go on stage and talk about my dad. Right. My dad is a big part of my stand up comedy. And what I think is so interesting about him as a character, because everything in stand up comedy is slightly removed from the truth. Right. It's hyperbolic. It's 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 creative. But. I think it's fun for them to see this image that they never are exposed to of like a loving Arab man who like loves his wife and like wants his daughter to succeed and is still afraid of her dating boys. These are all very, you know, Danny Thomas, American dad type of thing. So I don't think people get to see that anymore. And I love the fact that I don't have to wait for someone to green light my script or give me a chance to do a sitcom for me to have that image be something that people associate with me. A different side of Arab men, a different side of Muslim men that you don't often hear or see. Right. Who's that? Who's when you think of like that Muslim dad that is so loving and squishy that everyone thinks of, who is it? There are no images. Yeah, I was <laughs> right. I, I thought I was missing something. Right, I, I, I was missing myself. Great yeah. point. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. it used to be with the the African American community has lost their guy too. Yeah, they, that's they true. Have, but now they have Blackish, so he can be the new dad, the new. Which is such dad. a great show, by the way. I love that show. Yeah. You know, I love that show too. It's really original comedy. Anthony Anderson is brilliant. Yeah. He, well, and and it tells you something because because I think that show has broken out in the mainstream. Uh, it's very successful, and you know, again, to your earlier point, it's like saying, "Oh, will white people find you funny?" Like, aren't we aren't we past this? Isn't humor the universal we're not, language? We're not past that, and we're not past what I told you. Like, no casting director in the world will audition me to play a lawyer on Scandal. Why not? Hmm. Why not? 
Why, yeah. if the character is not written as disabled, can we not make that jump? And the other thing, back to circle back to the Muslim Funny Fest. So the Muslim Funny Fest is July 21st to the 23rd in New York City. And the reason that Dean and I are doing it is to combat this, this paper thin, one dimensional, cartoonish, terrorist, other alien image that is Muslim. And what I think the festival succeeds on two different levels, even before we get to the opening night, is it is such a diverse group of people. So you have all different skin colors, gender, sexual orientation, the entire nine yards. And you have different, like we said, the Muslim spectrum. You have cultural Muslims. You have like super, super devout, really educated Muslims. You have like moderate Muslims. You have converts. You have the whole gamut of who we are. And we each have such different life experiences. So one of the things that people are like, well, are they all going to be telling the same joke? Like, is it just like one I can't eat bacon festival? <laughs> When we did the New York Arab American Comedy Festival, there was always too many hummus jokes. And I have a feeling that bacon will be this festival's hummus. But other than that, you have such a diverse group of people that you're listening to all different kinds of comedians. And there's nothing repetitious or redundant about it. Because on top of the fact that we come from different cultures, different languages, different states in America. We also are all professional comedians, except for the two new talent that we're bringing in. And uh, so they know how to work a crowd. So you're coming to see top-notch comics who have been on you know, Showtime and HBO and who have sold out the Kennedy Center and so on and so forth. Well, and, and the show is coming up when? Muslim Funny Fest is July 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. July 21st, the guys from Allah Made Me Funny, Azhar Asman, Preacher Moss, and Mo Ahmed are reuniting for a wow. show uh, presented by us. Uh, Dean and I are going to co-host it, and it's Allah Made Me Funny Returns. And that's the opening night of the festival. And we decided that the opening night of the festival, we would do it at a venue that didn't serve alcohol so that okay. more conservative Muslims, if they wanted to come see this show, felt welcome. Um, sure. Because that's another thing our community does. Sometimes we tailor things so much for non-Muslims that we leave out our own community. So we right. wanted to find, you know, a happy medium. July 22nd and 23rd, we have comics from all over America and one comic from Canada and one from Dubai because they begged us and I felt bad and I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, as long as I don't have to pay you anything. So I was like, come on in. Um, but those nights are at the comic strip, the legendary comic strip in New York City, which I think it, it means a lot to me probably because I grew up in comedy clubs to be able to be on the comic strip stage presenting this festival because when I was a young comic and I auditioned, I didn't make the cut at the comic strip. So sure. it's nice to come back and sell out shows. I, I love that. And those two nights we have Rami Youssef, who was on Sea Dad Run with Scott Bayo and who is a real life Muppet. Like the boy looks like a Muppet. He behaves <laughs> like a Muppet. And I'm really excited because I love his comedy. We have Ali Saeed, who is the most well-known comic in Dubai which is like being a fish in the Dead Sea, but still, let's clap for him. And then we have um, Ali Hassan, who is a chef and comedian from Canada, and uh, Nagin Farsad, my friend from The Muslims Are Coming. She and I are reuniting for the closing night. It is the very first time that we have shared a stage since wow. The Muslims Are Coming, so that's happening. And we have Hisham, Hisham Faigi, is this Saudi dude who got really famous for a YouTube video called No Woman, No Cry. So he's going to be in the festival. And uh, the nights at the comic strip have eight comics each night. Um, and we have an even split between women and men. So take that. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's great. Pre that's pretty awesome. We 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 feel somehow like uh, Zaki, uh, you and I, like just being sort of uh, connected to so many of the folks that are on the show because we've had Azar on, we've had Who's Dean. Who's your favorite? 
Other, uh, than, other than me. <laughs> I was gonna say, what? <laughs> Who's your favorite? I'll tell you guys who my favorite comic is if you guys tell me. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I, I haven't heard. Uh, uh, I haven't heard all of them. Yeah. I, I, so I, I, no, I of the ones that you know. Oh. Um, well, I mean, for, for me, uh, Azur is a, a very old, old friend. So yeah. I, I, I feel like out of loyalty, I, I, have, to back, I have to back up my boy. <laughs> wait, wait. So what you're saying is it's not because he's the funniest? I feel like you're downplaying his funniness by saying I'm only saying this because he's my friend. Good point. Good, Good point. point. I feel like I've bu- oh, you know, we're running out of time actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's funny because I remember seeing Uzher yeah. like when he first started. Like like he was like, hey, I'm I'm thinking about doing comedy, and you know, I went to see him perform in the Chicago suburbs. So it's it's like uh, it's 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 amazing to me to to now see where he's at now because it's like, man, I I was there like pretty close to the beginning, you know. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot about charity from Azhar Asman. He is a really charitable guy, and I learned a lot about that from him. So he gets claps for the cat during this Ramadan from me. There we go. Hey, well, can and- you do a show where I set up people and we make them get married the same day? <laughs> <laughs> That, 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 well, we'll, we'll, I think we'll, have to, sight. We'll, we'll have to start a whole new podcast for that, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so Muslim Funny Fest, really easy to find. It's MuslimFunnyFest.com. If you don't know how to spell MuslimFunnyFest.com, maybe you could go to Google and put Muslim and comedy and something will come up. What One hopes. One hope. Yeah, but I have no idea what's gonna come up. So like, <laughs> it's a gamble, admittedly. Well, well, Mason, I know that uh, we're we're running out of time with you, but real quick, where can people find you? Do you know why you're running out of time? Please tell us. Because at 3 p.m. on the East Coast General Hospitals on TV. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> priorities. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's Ramadan. <laughs> Well, before General Hospital starts, uh, where can people find you online? Uh, my website is maysoon.com, www.maysoon.com. Like the month of May is coming soon. I was 18 and I bought my name because I knew I was destined for greatness. And now people keep trying to buy it from me because may soon means something in English. Like you may soon get married, you may soon get divorced, you may soon buy a house. So people offer me money for it and I will not. So I am, I'm maysoon.com if people want to like know where I'm going to be on the road and stuff like that. And then I'm on Twitter and some horrible, awful, just shaitan of a person has at maysoon and she only tweeted once in like 2009. So I wasn't able to get at maysoon. So I'm at Maysoon Zayed, which is really hard to spell. But if you go to Google and put Twitter Maysoon, you'll find me. And I'm actually on Twitter 24 hours a day to the point where I tell people, if you ever get to the point where, like, you're so depressed you don't know what to do, just tweet me. I'm there. <laughs> well, there we go. Well, Mason, thank you so much yeah. uh, for, for coming on with us. This was this is a blast. So we're we're hoping that you'll Can be able you to come not, on with us. Could you not make it all the way through without one reference to violence? I know it's you were so close to the end, uh, and almost at the finish away. line. Oh, oh. I, uh, well, uh, next time. See, we, we'll this is this is we'll, we'll perfect it next time. Inshallah. 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 Thank you so much, guys. You bet. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming on. Bye-bye. And on behalf of uh, my co-host, Pervez Ahmed, this is Zaki Hassan. Uh, you can find our show at uh, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence and email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Please keep those emails coming. We, lo- we love the comments. We also love the suggestions. Uh, because that's been kind of the great thing about doing the show is that people say, oh, you know, we'd love for you to, I think this would be a great guest. And, you know, I, it's honestly, I, I don't know about you, Pervez, but I find so many people who I've, Never even thought about it. And I'm like, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Those have been really helpful. So keep those coming. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening for I, – I know we've uh, upped the frequency the uh, last few episodes, and we've, we've, we've enjoyed it. We've, we've hoped you guys have enjoyed it as well. In, inshallah, uh, to following Mason's lead, inshallah, we'll keep that momentum going. Inshallah, yeah. And with that, uh, on behalf of my colleague, uh, I am Zaki Hassan, and this is Diffuse Congruence. We'll see you next time. 